you are reviewing your patient's labs and the hemoglobin is 7.8 grams per deciliter. Immediately, you feel concerned for this patient. You do a physical exam and it is benign. Review the patient's vital signs. They're stable. He's not complaining of any shortness of breath, fatigue, and says that he actually feels okay. Based on this lab number, do you feel tempted to pull the trigger and order a blood transfusion? The reality is that many healthcare practitioners do, especially after these patients undergo major elective surgery, like let's say a total joint replacement. But is it correct to order a blood transfusion in a case like this? Shouldn't we first pause and use our clinical training to make a diagnosis? What other medical strategies can we use, especially when we want to avoid a transfusion? Hello everyone, is nurse practitioner Jessica here from NP Insiders. If you want to expand your medical knowledge and fast track your career growth and practice, you've come to the right place. So let's jump into it. Blood transfusion is one of the most common procedures performed in hospitals in the United States, but it is so overused that it was targeted at the Joint Commission Overuse Summit and even compared to the inappropriate use of antibiotics for the common cold. This topic is so hot that one of the most well-respected journals, Nature, wrote a very powerful article about this and urged for a paradigm shift. Instead of using the common slogan, give blood, save lives, the article was titled, save blood, save lives. It interviews experts in the field and they all agree that the right approach is to learn to cut back on the blood transfusions. For many decades, study after study has tried to define the best practices when it comes to blood transfusion. 11 landmark randomized clinical trials have demonstrated that ordering blood transfusions for stable patients with a hemoglobin of 7 grams per deciliter or higher may be inappropriate. The studies showed that giving that blood transfusion had no effect and in many cases the patients ended up with a worse outcome. So there was a detrimental effect when the patient was transfused. But if giving a blood transfusion is inappropriate in these cases, then how do we take care of these patients? The short answer is by applying patient blood management strategies. This is Patient Blood Management Awareness Week, and I want to show you how you too can better take care of your patients. Let's look at what a California hospital was able to do. So by simply reminding practitioners about the current blood transfusion guidelines, they reduce 24% of blood transfusions, decrease their length of hospital stay for patients from 10 days down to 6 days, and to me the most telling was the reduction in mortality which fell down from 5.5% to 3.3%. Also, the icing on the cake was that they saved $1.6 million per year. But patient blood management is not just abiding to blood tri triggers or blood transfusion guidelines. Instead, real PBM or patient blood management is patient center. It's all about the patient and all about the patient's blood health and its optimization. So what does that all mean? Well, managing preparative anemia is so critical and can mean life or death to a lot of our patients. Early detection and ongoing anemia management, even with IV iron infusions, should be the norm. Nutritional intervention to support blood cell production is another way that we can apply. Figuring out what is causing the anemia and arresting that, that is the medical model. That is what should be done. Restricting blood draws, meaning not having standing daily blood draws so that we can do bloodletting from our patients. Another strategy by anesthesia is to use acute normal bulimic hemodilution. Meticulous surgical technique is vital, especially for patients undergoing major uh, non-cardiac and or cardiac surgery. Let me pause here for a second. Did you know that Whipple patients who are Jehovah's Witnesses and, and do not accept uh, blood transfusions lose half as much blood as other Whipple patients? So why is that the case? Because in their cases, we use all the available blood 
patient blood management strategies and we use strict application of blood conservation on these patients. Surgeons and their staff are tying off small bleeders, aggressively cauterizing, letting experienced providers do the cutting and suturing, using things like cell saver and aquamantis to seal blood vessels rather than cutting or burning them. I mean, this shows the ability that we have and is documented all over in the literature, medically and surgically, to perform bloodless surgeries and to apply patient blood management. The Evidence is there, and these patients have allowed us to perform that. John Hopkins has actually published a lot of data on this subject. They have applied these same strategies to all of their patients and improved patients' blood health, saving their lives and reducing exposure to blood transfusions that are sometimes can be deadly. They have even they even did a study where they matched JW patients to similar patients that accepted blood transfusions, and then they compared the outcomes. So what were the results? The bloodless patients did just as well, or in some instances, even better than the patients who accepted the blood transfusions. They looked at heart attacks, respiratory and renal complications, pulmonary embolisms, and found there was no difference between the two groups. The bloodless patients had actually fewer infections and experienced fewer hospital deaths. This was so significant. Okay, so what are the take home points that you should remember? Let's recap. Number one, there is a big cultural issue with the overuse of blood transfusion and a lot of transfusion orders may not even be based on the latest medical guidelines, which is very detrimental to all of our patients, Jehovah's Witness patients or not. Number two, the goal here is to apply the medical model that we all know, that of diagnosing the patient, treating the diagnosis medically instead of just depending on the product option right away, which is the blood transfusion. And number three, the more we learn about blood transfusions, the less likely we are to use it. Instead of using the blood transfusion, we use patient blood management strategies that have been proven to be more effective and safer and increase patient safety also saving our patients' lives and decreasing the amount of hospital stay and suffering that they experience. Patient blood management focuses on evidence-based bundles of care to optimize both medically and surgical patients. If applied correctly, it can even eliminate the need for blood transfusions. I invite you to check SABM, the Society for the Advancement of Patient Blood Management, to learn more. This society is amazing. I have attended so many of their conferences, both virtually and in person, and I have learned so much from them. And as a matter of fact, I was able to implement a big change in my institution and a lot, especially of the joint replacement patients, benefited from this. This also respects patients' self-determination, especially those where blood transfusion is not an option. So I definitely invite you to check out sabam.org. And of course, like always, check out my website, www.mpinsiders.com and subscribe to this channel. We definitely tar tackle and target a lot of these medical conditions here.